Bible reveals that all of creation was created to bring glory to God. The Bible says in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork. Not only all of creation, but humanity was created as the centerpiece of God's creation to bring glory to him. But the reality is, is that the world is not necessarily doing that. Humanity in bulk, seven billion people living on the face of the earth are not worshiping the way that we should. There truly is a worship disorder. But we here at Cross Connection believe that we are to be a people who worship together, that bring praise, honor, and glory to God as one people. And so what we're doing here in a series at the church called Life and Connection, we're talking right now about the importance of us gathering together and worshiping the one true God as one voice. So take some time to study through the scriptures with us tonight. I think you'll be encouraged. God bless. Again, if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand and ushers will bring you on Romans chapter 12, verse 1. There, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, help us to do that. Lord, help us to worship you, not just when we gather here Amen. as a body, but to worship you day in and day out, to worship you in things that might seem mundane, in tasks that may be repetitive. Lord, help us to worship and honor you, not just with our, our lips, with our mouths, but with the way that we live. Lord, that people would see and know that we are followers of you by the way that we live and love. And so, God, work into us. Lord, transform us by the renewing of our minds today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your people and to worship you as one body. And we pray that you be glorified and honored by it. For we ask this in Jesus' name, and all God's people agreed, saying, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This last week, we began a new series here at the church called Life in Connection. We are seeking to clearly articulate our mission and vision and values. This is something that we do annually at the beginning of each year. We take time to look forward into the new year and talk about what our vision is for that. But this year is a little bit different than past years because what we're doing this year is looking not only at our vision for 2014, but our vision for who we are as a church. And so we want to express who we are and why we exist, what we do and how we do it as a community of faith, as the people of God. If you look at the sermon guide that's in your bulletin, this side that says Life in Connection, it has the logo for the church on it, you'll see there the vision and the values. We shared this last week, but wanted just to look at it again this morning. Vision, why we exist, it says, because of the cross of Christ, we know that we have been connected to God and one another in life-giving and satisfying communion. As a family of faith, we grow together into his likeness by worship and the application of his word. And as a community of faith, we go to labor together for the joy and justice of all peoples. And then immediately following that at the bottom is our values. How do we do that? How do we make that a reality? It says, we believe that a church is a gathering of individuals connected to God and one another by the cross of Christ. To facilitate this life in connection, cross connection, this church aims to promote a vision for worship and fellowship, discipleship, ministry, mission, and generosity. At the core of our vision is a love for God, one another, and the world. Last week, we spent our time really looking at that vision and thinking about it. For us as believers here at Cross Connection Church to live a life in connection with God and one another, that which was broken by sin and by the fall is, is brought back to life there in Christ. And so we are now connected to God. We're connected to one another. We have communion with him and community with one another. And we want to live out this life that is more abundant. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly or that you may have it to its fullest. But to experience that life more abundantly, it's lived in community and in communion with God. It's lived in connection with one another. And so we're going to be looking at today and for the next four weeks after this, the specifics of each of these values. And so today, if you notice there, it says week two, worship together. That's what we're focusing on. Notice in the values there, it says, we, Cross Connection, aims to promote a vision for worship. 
We aim to promote a vision for worship. Worship is foundational to us experiencing the abundant life. It is core to experiencing this life in connection. But perhaps the immediate question after you say that we seek to promote a vision of worship within our church, within this community of faith, is why? Why promote a vision for worship? And to answer that question, I'd ask you to turn into the Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel, right after 1 Samuel, near the beginning of your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22. It's just before 1 Kings, 2 Samuel 22, verse 1 is where we're going to be. And we have here in 2 Samuel 22 the words of perhaps the most worshipful individual of the Bible, King David, Amen. the great psalmist of Israel. You know, you have the Psalms in your Bible. The, the longest book of the Bible is dedicated towards songs of worship, and most of those songs of worship called Psalms were written by King David, this great man of God and king of Israel. There in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, we read this. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song, one day, or on the day that the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of King Saul. And so here, David has come to a point in his life where there is security, where there has been salvation from all of his enemies, from King Saul, who for a period of time was trying to track him down, for many years was trying to take his life. And now at this point, he, we are given the context of the words that he writes this song about. And he said, verse 2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. Now look at this, verse 4. I will call upon the Lord who is what? I'll call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. If you turn your sermon guide over there and look at point number one on the back of it, point number one in our outline, God is worthy of worship. God is worthy of worship. King David recognized that. He, he understood that 3,000 years ago as he had seen God literally move mountains in his life as he had seen God protect him miraculously on many times throughout his life, as he had seen God conquer enemies before him in powerful ways, as he sees God move in power, he says, you are worthy of my praise, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. Speaking of salvation, speaking of the God who is our deliverer, he says, you are worthy to be praised. God is truly worthy to be praised and worshipped. Now, the first time in the Bible that the word worship is used is back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 22. We don't have time to go through the whole story in Genesis chapter 22. It's an awesome passage. But there, God instructs Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, to take a journey, which took about a three-day journey, to the land of Moriah, which is modern day, the city of Jerusalem. He says, I want you to go to the land of Moriah, and you're going to worship there with your son Isaac. You're going to worship me. And so he goes on this journey and he tells his son there, we are going to worship the Lord. And that word worship, the Hebrew word shakah, it means to bow down before, to bend the knee before, or, or literally to prostrate yourself, which means to lay flat on your face before someone or something. And that symbolism of laying flat on your face, there is a recognition that you, the one I'm bowing down before, are greater than me. You are over me. And I am laying myself as low as I possibly can because to be in your presence is such a distinct honor. To be in your presence is a, a reverential thing, a fearful thing, because you are so much higher than I. That's what the word worship in the Hebrew means. That's what it carries with it. Now, the English word worship, it it's, comes from an old English word. It first appears in our language about the 12th, 13th century AD, and it means to acknowledge the worth or the value of. It, it's worship. You're acknowledging the worth or the worthiness of someone to receive your reverence. We adore, we praise, we glory, we revere only that which we deem to be worthy of our worship. 
And so when he says here, David, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, you are worthy to be praised, to be worshipped, to be adored, he's saying, I have recognized that of all the things in all of creation, in all of the universe, you are over all of those things. There is nothing, there is no one greater and more valuable and worthy of worship than you. And so that's what David is saying there in Psalm or um, in First Samuel chapter or Second Samuel twenty two, and that's what Abraham is acknowledging back in Genesis chapter twenty two. And when we say, "God, we worship and praise you," you're worthy of our praise. We're acknowledging that God is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of not just singing songs, but our complete and total devotion to him, which is something we'll look at in a moment. We already read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We'll look at it more in just a little bit. But it's the idea of completely devoting ourselves to his glory. We've considered many times before that the very first thing we learn about God in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 is that God is creator. Romans chapter 1 tells us in verse 20 that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by what is made. So when we look at creation, God is seen in his creation, although he is separate from his creation. His creation declares that he is, and his creation declares that he is great. And when you look at the detail and the beauty of his creation, it reveals that not only is God powerful, but it reveals that God is creative and artistic. Artistic. He is creative and artistic. How many of you recognize God's beauty in his creation? And then remember, we live in a fallen creation. We live in a world that has been subjected to the fall and curse because of sin, and yet we see the beauty and the detail of it. And in our day, we have an amazing opportunity to see the awesome beauty of the creation going out far into the universe, greater than any other people at any other time in history because of things like the Hubble Space Telescope. And we see these grand pictures of nebula and things that are going on. When we look at the sky at nighttime and we look out there, and we go, wow, that's amazing, that's awesome. But then when we see the pictures of what Hubble returns, we go, that is phenomenal to see these awesome things that are taking place in places we could never get to, we could never go to. Now, I hope that in the future, when we're with the Lord, he's going to take us on a tour of these things someday. But for now, we just get pictures. But in those pictures, we see God's beauty. And not just that, when, when people here on earth look down into the deep molecular and cellular la- uh, levels, when they look at the atomic levels of creation and we see the detail and the way that God has engineered everything, and, and you know, we have to agree with what King David said in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork. Amen. You see, we were created as instruments of worship. This whole creation was created to bring glory back to God, to reflect his glory, his beauty, his awesome power, his amazing intellect. It is seen in his creation, just as David says there in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, the earth shows forth his handiwork. In the very same way that the ceiling, the frescoes on the Sistine Chapel in Rome, they show the artistic mastery of Michelangelo. They declare how awesome this guy was. You know, I can hardly draw a stick figure. And so you look at that and you're just in awe of what he's done. And maybe you've never been there, but you can see it online. You just punch in the Sistine Chapel and look at this amazing work that took more than four years for him to create. And just that alone declares that that artist existed, that he had great mastery and skill. And in the very same way, this the existence of creation, the beauty of creation, it declares that God is. It declares how awesome and wonderful he is, that he is into aesthetics. He loves beauty. And so God created for his glory. He created so that people would see what he has done and glorify him. And not just that people would, but that the earth would cry forth of his greatness. And not only the earth, but we. We were created as instruments of God. Point number two on your outline. We were created as instruments of worship. Would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah? Right about the middle of your Bible, you'll be in the Psalms and then keep turning to the right. Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to look at two verses here. Isaiah 43 verse 7, and then verse 21. Isaiah 43, 7. There, God is speaking to and through the prophet Isaiah, and he says this, Isaiah 43, 7. 
Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my, what? Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Then verse 21, it says, this people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. So we are instruments of worship. And we are to sound forth, to declare the praises of God. Now, I know if you're an astute Bible studier, you'll say, hey, with the context is Israel. And I agree. Isaiah was written during the time that God is speaking to his people, the nation of Judah, about the 8th century B.C. But if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says of us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's own special or peculiar people. Why? That we should declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So he has brought us into this as well. God created for his glory, and he created you and I, humanity, that we would be those who sound forth his beauty, that we declare his praise. He fashioned us to be image bearers of him. He created us in his image and likeness. So we carry with us the image of God, and we are to reflect his greatness back to him and to all of creation, we would be on display showing how great and awesome our God is. Now, it may seem odd to say this, but we can back it up with scripture. We, humanity, are the centerpiece of the masterpiece of creation. We are the centerpiece of the masterpiece of creation. God, this great artist, has made this masterpiece, and he's placed us at the center as image bearers of him to declare his praise to magnify him, to worship him. And so we are to reflect it back, how great and awesome he is, his glory. And if all creation is singing a song of praise to God, which they are, you remember in the Gospels, as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and people are singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's a group of religious leaders that say, tell your disciples to stop this. And he said, if they did, even the rocks would what? Cry out. out. Creation is singing forth in glorious praise to God. And if that is true, then because of the way that God made us, humanity is like the soloist in that song. We are to be sounding it forth in a greater way. Why? Because God created us with the capacity to think. He created us with the capacity to speak and write and build and to create and all of this so that we could return glory back to him. You you see this nowhere else in creation. Even the highest life forms underneath humanity, we do not see apes and gorillas going in and, you know, we'll grab a banana from over here and let's grab a little bit of spices over here and we'll combine these and we'll make it really good so it shows just how wonderful. Or let's go and build this wonder. They don't do that. But humanity was created in the image and likeness of God to create in the same similar way that he does so that we can show forth his glory. And it's not just in doing those sort of things. Even in the very mundane and repetitive tasks of life, we can and should worship God. We have a responsibility to do that. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says there, and whatever you do, Whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Even to the most repetitive, mundane things that you and I do on a daily basis, we can and should be bringing glory to God. Now, I will say, it is a a challenge to bring glory to God while you're eating pizza, but you, you can do it. There's a way. We can discover that more as we live out life together. But the reality is that we should be returning glory and praise to God in the smallest things, the smallest things that we do. Life is meant to be worship to God. Not just what we do here on a Sunday morning, but our entire lives are to be worship to God. But the sad reality is, number three on your outline, sin devastated worship. Sin corrupted worship. You can either either say devastated or corrupted, both is true. Sin devastated and corrupted worship. Worship The fall of humanity, we talked quite a bit about it in our last series during the Christmas season about the fall in Genesis chapter 3. It brought devastating corruption to the glory song of creation. Humanity, through sin, separated himself from the symphony. If all of creation was created to bring glory to God, the heavens declare the glory of God, the earth shows forth his handiwork, and humanity at the center of that is to be returning praise to God. And in the fall in Genesis chapter 3, man kind of stepped away from that and has separated him from the symphony. Now, it's not that we're no longer worshiping. 
It's not that we no longer have the capacity to worship because we were actually formed as instruments of worship. God made you, made me to be an instrument of worship. And by our very nature, we will worship something. If we're not worshiping him, which the fall separated us from right and honorable worship of him, if we're not worshiping him, we will worship. We will always default to worship of someone or something. And so when the fall brought in this this, uh, separation of us from worship, we now are worshiping but not in the right way. It's as if all of creation is playing this song of praise to God and man in the middle of it is singing another tune in a different key at a different tempo and twice as loud as everything else. And so it's discordant. There is a dissonance in that worship. And and I'm sure you've heard dissonant or discordant chords before when you, you know, if a little kid goes in and starts pounding on the piano, there's no music there. Nobody pays money to go and watch that at all. They just go, oh, great, here we go again. Gun, 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 you know? That's not music. Now, unfortunately, there's some music being sold today like that, but it's being said, this is music. It's very abstract. You've got to, like, feel it. No, it's not music. There's not music there. And so humanity has brought discord into this, this masterpiece of God. And so point number four on your outline, all sin is ultimately a worship disorder. All sin is ultimately a worship disorder. And that's what we see in the world today, that there is this massive worship disorder. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans again, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul does a great job of expressing this in Romans 1, beginning at verse 20. There he writes this. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his, God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. So creation declares that he is. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that man is without excuse. When he's worshiping something else, he has no excuse. He can't say, well, I just didn't know that I should be worshiping God. He has no excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. There is a choice here. We chose to no longer be in concert with all of creation in worshiping the one true God. Neither were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became as fools and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man. And when it says they changed, you could read it, they exchanged. They said, there is the glorious God, and he should be worshipped, but no, we're going to worship something else. We're going to worship something below him. We're going to worship something even below us. And so they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, and they began to worship an image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, because of this, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged, there it is again, the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen amen. All sin is ultimately a worship disorder. We were created by God as instruments of worship. And so we will always worship something. We'll always go and and land on something for our adoration, our devotion. And if it's not God, we'll devote ourselves to something in the universe, in the cosmos, in this world. And when we do that, there will always be a great problem that will come. It is our nature to praise, honor, adore, bow down to, reverence, glory, exalt, venerate, whatever it is. And if we refuse to worship rightly, if we refuse to bring glory to God, then we will worship anything else. And misdirected worship is idolatry. Misdirected worship is idolatry, and all sin is ultimately a worship disorder of misdirected worship. It's ultimately idolizing something. God created us with talents and abilities and gifts. Look around this room. There's about 200 people in here right now. And in this room, each individual has unique gifts and talents and abilities. We may have similarities in some areas, but no one of us is identical. And the gifts, talents, and abilities that God fashioned us with, he created you in your mother's womb with those gifts and talents and abilities. And all of those are ultimately to be used for his worship, for his glory. 
But the, the ruling religion of modern day America is self-worship. And not only is that the ruling religion of the day, it is religiously taught in our institutions, our educational institutions in the form of what is called self-esteem. How many of you guys have heard of self-esteem before? We are religiously instructing people in our culture to worship themselves, worship themselves, worship themselves. And it is idolatry. Because there is only one who is worthy of our worship. And you may love yourself, and there may be some great things about yourself, but you're not worthy of worship and devotion. Only he is worthy of worship and devotion. And yet, self-worship is the ruling religion of the day. We take what God has given, our gifts and our talents and our abilities, and we use them for our own glorification and for our own gratification. And in that is idolatry. You know, I was thinking about this this last week, just pondering this idea that we use our gifts and talents and abilities for our own glorification and gratification. And I'll admit, this illustration, it's easy to pick on this group of people, but celebrities, and specifically musically talented celebrities. I started to think, how many of these musicians, is there a list somewhere out there, and I knew even as I was thinking about it, I could find it with Google, is there a list of musicians who began singing and bringing praise and glory in the church. But then they've moved from there and they've gone out and now they're bringing self-glorification and self-gratification by their gifts, talents, and abilities that God gave them to be used for his glory and now they're using it for themselves. And here's the list that I found. There, this is a list of some of those people. Britney Spears, Beyonce, Justin, Justin Timberlake, Avril Lavigne, Snoop Dogg, really? Snoop Dogg, Whitney Houston, John Legend, Katy Perry, Jessica Simpson, Usher, Aretha Franklin, Carrie Underwood, Diana Ross, Elvis Presley, and many others, all of them, where did they get their start? In a church. Now, like I said, it's easy to pick on them. They're out there in the front. It's easy to do that. But every single human being, if they're not worshiping God, using their gifts, talents, and abilities ultimately for his glory, then they have a worship disorder. It's idolatry. Ultimately, these things are to be used for his glorification. But we all, in some way, shape, or form, are caught up in worship disorders. And even after we come to Christ by grace through faith, we still have these problems, these worship disorders, and we need to learn how to rightly worship, how to rightly bring praise, honor, and glory to the only one who is worthy of it. Why? Because number five in your outline, worship is transformational. Worship is transformational. Turn in your Bibles to the Psalms, Psalm 115. I mentioned this verse last week, but I want to actually go to it this week. This is said twice in the Psalms, but we're going to look at it in Psalm 115. Under the heading that worship is transformational, we look at Psalm 115, verse 4. The idols... Of this world are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throats. Verse 8, this is the kicker. Those who make them are what? Like them. them. Those who make them are like them, and so is everyone who trusts in them. Worship is transformational. The God that you worship is the God that you will ultimately become, the thing that you will ultimately become. Paul speaks about this. We just looked at it in Romans chapter 1, where he said, professing to be wise, they became as fools. And God allowed them to be turned over to a debased mind. Why? Because they were worshiping things that were foolish and vain. And in worshiping things that are foolish and vain, you will become foolish and vain as well. Even if you're professing wisdom, you will become foolish and vain. How do I know that? Well, look around at the intelligentsia of our society today. Perhaps you saw that documentary that Ben Stein did a few years ago. It was great. The very last scene of the documentary is he's sitting down talking with Richard Dawkins, of course, the most antagonistic atheist of our day. He's saying the same things that atheists have been saying for a long time. It's just repackaged a little bit differently. And so what does he boil it down to at the very end of that that documentary, when they ask him, when they press him about, well, where did life come from? Because you admit that the intricacy of life, it just couldn't have appeared. He said, well, maybe, uh, maybe aliens seeded the earth. Okay, all right, sounds good. 
That's the best you've got, huh? Yep, that's it. Professing to be wise, they became as fools. And whatever you worship, you will ultimately become. If you worship foolishness and vanity, you will become foolish and vain. The 19th century American poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said this, the gods we worship write their names on our faces. Be sure of that. And a man will worship something. That which dominates will determine his life and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. What we are worshiping, we are becoming. And this, of course, is true for bad, but it is also true for good. Turn again back to the verse we began with, Romans chapter 12, the beginning, or the end of your Bibles there, Romans 12, 1. Romans 12, 1. Paul is speaking to Christians. Christians who were living in a hedonistic, paganistic, pluralistic culture in the first century Roman world, the city of Rome. He was speaking to a group of people who were living in a culture that is more and more like ours every day. And he says this, this is to Christians living in that culture who were being pulled by the world to conform with the practices of the world in worship, to be a part of the worship disorder. And so he speaks with very passionate and fervent language when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I am begging you, Christians in Rome, I'm begging you by the mercies of God, by his power, by his strength, by his mercy, that you present your what? Bodies. Bodies. This instrument of worship, God created this to be an instrument glorifying him. Present it by a, a choosing of your will, a volitional move. Make the decision to present this instrument of worship as a living sacrifice, holy, that means consecrated, completely dedicated, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship, your reasonable service, your only right response, another translation says. And in doing this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our vision statement there on the other side of your sermon outline, it says there in the middle of it, as a family of God, we grow together into his likeness by worship. Worship is transformational. And as we worship him, we devote ourselves to him, we honor, glorify, reverence him, we are being changed more and more into his image, his likeness. We grow more into his likeness by worship and the application of his word. It is a part of our sanctification. God uses proper worship in our lives to make us more like him. Therefore, point number six on your outline, we fulfill our purpose when we worship together. We fulfill our purpose when we worship together. Now, after I wrote that out and I gave this to Karen to print up for today, I was thinking more about number six and I came up with another Another answer, so an alternate answer. They're both right. We fulfill our purpose when we worship together. Secondly, we experience our destiny when we worship together. Pastor Josh read from Revelation chapter 5 this morning as we were worshiping in giving. Revelation chapter 5, you can turn there if you'd like. I'd encourage you to read the whole passage later on. I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, but Revelation chapter 5 is this awesome vision of the Apostle John as he describes a scene in heaven that we believe is still in the future. This hasn't yet happened yet. He describes a scene in heaven, and he's there, and there are multitudes of angelic beings, and there are tens of thousands of saints from every tribe and tongue and nation in the world gathered there before the throne of God, and a strong angel, verse 2 of Revelation 5 says, a strong angel, he spoke forth and said, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals of it? And no one was found, John says, no one was found that was worthy to take the scroll and open the seals of it. And he begins, begins to weep. And there in verse 5, as he begins to weep, one of the elders that is there in heaven, the 24 elders, he says to John, he reaches over and says, do not weep, behold, 
The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and he is worthy. So there they are in heaven. The angel said, who is worthy? No one is found except for the only one that is worthy. And Jesus steps forth, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as he steps forth, now, now imagine in your mind, what would you anticipate this elder says, oh, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has, he's prevailed. He's going to open the scroll. And now one steps forth. You're anticipating this great lion that comes forth. And what do you see? He says, behold, we saw a lamb as it had been slain. Amen and amen. Jesus, right. the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8 says, John the Baptist said in John chapter 2, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was the lamb that was slain in his first coming. And he still bears the scars of that slaying but now he comes as a conquering king. And Pastor Josh read Revelation 5, 9. But I'm going to start at verse 8. Revelation 5, 8. Now when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down. What is that? Worship. Worship. They fell down before the lamb, each having a harp, an instrument, and golden bowls full of incense, which they were are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, out of every tongue, out of every people, and out of every nation. Amen. Our purpose, for which we were created as instruments of worship, and our ultimate destiny is the worship of the one true God. That is our purpose and our ultimate destiny, that we would worship together. So when we gather together as a body to worship together, now don't misunderstand, life is worship, so we should be aiming to worship personally, individually, every single day, wherever we are and whatever we're doing. But when we gather together in worship, we are experiencing, tasting our destiny, and we are fulfilling our purpose because we are joining in with the chorus of creation and worshiping him and praising him. Amen. Now, as we close, I just want to add a few more important things. First, our lives on a daily basis are to be lived as worship to God in the mundane things. And we should be striving to make that a reality, presenting our bodies as living sacrifice, as Paul exhorted us in Romans chapter 12. We should be seeking for that to become real and learning what that means regularly. We already looked at that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. But this only happens as we grow in our understanding of worship and our engagement in worship together. So when we come together and worship together, and we worship in three different ways here at Cross Connection, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but when we worship together in the study of the scriptures, we are growing in our understanding of worship and how right worship is offered to God, and we're growing in our understanding of who he is, which increases our worship, and then we engage in worship together, and that infuses us for worship on a regular basis daily. So this is important. This is why the author of the book of Hebrews says, do not neglect the assembling together, the gathering together. And so when we worship, when we gather as a body on a Sunday morning, a Saturday night, or whenever we get together, we worship in three ways. Number one, we worship in song. Number two, we worship in sacrificial giving. It's worship. And thirdly, we worship in the study of the scriptures. At least those three are happening when we gather together in worship. We're worshiping in song, in sacrificial giving, and in the study of the scriptures. Now, song and sacrificial giving. Turn quickly to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Just to the left of Revelation, not too far. Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 15, I want to show that this is biblical, that we worship in song and in sacrificial giving. It's right here in verses 15 and 16 of Hebrews 13. I'm greatly running out of time. Hebrews 13, 15, therefore, by him, by Jesus, let us continually, does continually mean once in a while? Continually. Offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, what is the sacrifice of praise to God? Well, he explains, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let us corporately, 
gather together continually, offer the sacrifice of praise. In the Old Testament, there were very physical, tangible sacrifices. You would go to the tabernacle, you would go to the temple, and you would bring a lamb, or you would bring a goat, or you would bring a bull, or even you would bring sometimes a grain offering, whatever it was, and it would be sacrificed tangibly. And God was well pleased by the incense that rose from that. We don't have that in the New Testament. That's been done away with. Hebrews is all about doing away with the Old Covenant. But we still have New Testament sacrifices. Well, one of them is this, the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Second one, verse 16, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, the fruit of our lips and doing good and sharing, God is well pleased. God is well pleased in the Old Testament by the incense rising to him, the worship of those sacrifices. God is, he is glorified, he is pleased with this sacrifice. The sacrifice of praise, worship being given from the fruit of our lips, and then the sacrifice of giving and sharing, good and sharing. Now, this word sharing, it's the Greek word koinonia. It is a word that is multifaceted, Great definitions, it means fellowship, communion, community. It also means, in other places, it also means participation, gift, contribution, and collection. When we gather together and we share with one another and we give sacrificially of ourselves, it is a form of worship to God. And he is well pleased with this worship. Well, not only that, I said that we worship in the study of God's word, in the study of the scriptures. In his book, Worship Matters, Bob Coughlin writes this, the better or more accurately we know God through his word, the more genuine our worship will be. Regardless of what we think or feel, there is no authentic worship of God without a right knowledge of him. When we study the scriptures together, it is joining us together in our understanding of who he is, how he works, and how we are to rightly worship him. And so when we gather together for a service like this, this is not necessarily the worship service and then you're done. This is what ignites our worship and we should go from here continuing to worship him. That's the ideal and that's what we're looking to move towards, to make a reality of who we are. Now, seventh and finally on your outline, and we're done. Music is important as an on-ramp to worship and not the destination. Music is important as an on-ramp to worship and not the destination. Music, in and of itself, is not worship. But God created worship, or music, as an end avenue to worship. He made music in such a way. Music is not the invention of man. It is the creation of God. That's right. He created music, I believe, to be the fastest on-ramp to worship. Now, just 50 feet behind me is an on-ramp, an off-ramp for a major freeway. And the whole point of it is that you're to be able to go on that on-ramp and get up to speed so that when you get on the freeway, you're doing a very nice 65 miles an hour, which is what all of you do. Right? I hate those meters that stop you. It's to be an on-ramp. Let's go, right? Worship, music, is to be a fast on-ramp to worship. God created music in that way. How so? God made music to affect us at a soul and emotional level. He crea- How many of you recognize there's soul in music, right? There should be. And it should stir emotion. Have you ever watched a, a movie without music? It's like, what is this? The, the heightened sense of what, music adds all of that. That's right. All of that. Now, I'm not recommending the movie. I, please bear with me. It's a terrible illustration. A few years ago, that Batman movie came out with the Joker. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Some of you probably saw it. I'm not recommending it. But there is, there is this sound, this musical sound, that the composer, Hans Zimmer, he, he wrote the music. Listen to the musical score. It's incredible. But there is this sound that he created with a saw. And then he slowed it down and he added all kinds of these effects to it. And every time you hear it, it is the sound of the joker coming. And it is the scariest sound in the world. 
just that sound sends, you're just like, oh, goodness. And you know something bad is coming. Music should affect us at an emotional soul level. And when the music engages your emotions and your mind is engaged by the lyrics and directed Godward, that means toward God, then the outcome can be worship. The heart is engaged emotionally by the music. The mind is engaged intellectually by the lyrics that direct you towards God, and there is worship. You don't have to have music. You can have an emotional experience standing at the edge of Niagara Falls or standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, and if your mind is engaged toward God, there is worship that happens. But music is a fast on-ramp to worship. Now, I say that it is an on-ramp and not the destination for this reason. We need to be careful and understand there is no such thing as emotionless worship. Just like there is no such thing as emotionless love. They don't go together. There's no such thing as emotionless worship. But in our culture, Christian culture today, unfortunately, emotion is the focal point of the worship service. And so here's what happens. A person says, I have worshipped quote unquote, I've worshipped if they feel heightened emotion and happiness. I've worshipped. And if you break it down, the enemy, our adversary, the devil, he is cunning. He has taken something that is incredibly spiritually oriented, worship, and he has made it idolatry. Why? Because he has created this to be, and it's a very fine line, we have to be very careful with this, he has created it to be that we come into this in worship service, and if Heightened emotion and happiness is the point of it, then you're the focus of it. You see that? We say we're coming to worship God. You go, it wasn't very good. Why? Well, I didn't cry. I didn't feel. You go, well, then worship was all about you and not about God. Very fine line. So music is an on-ramp to worship and not the destination. And we need to be very careful about this. Because why? God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship. I'm going to ask George, the worship team, to come back up. I know we've gone over a little bit. They're going to lead us in one last worship song. Would you stand with me? Now, as we prepare to worship the Lord, let's close our eyes. We pray. As you're closing your eyes, if you today have not bent the knee in worship of Jesus Christ, you never have, you've not acknowledged him as your Lord and put your trust in him, you are not experiencing the fullness of what you were created for. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that one day every knee will bow, but it is far better to choose to do so now. And I want to give you an opportunity today to do that if you never have. Amen.